Good afternoon, everybody. There's not even one person awake in here. It's raining, I know. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right, I am very happy to be back here. My name is Dr. Bill Kareva. How many of you have been in one of my other presentations previously? How many of you, this is your first time seeing me present? Okay, that kind of gives me an idea where we're at. I am extremely happy to be here today. Um, I've been here a couple times giving presentations on different health-related topics, and today we're going to be talking about peak performance. How many of you would like to be able to achieve peak levels of energy and performance throughout the course of the day consistently, day in and day out? I mean, I think that'd be pretty cool. Then that's what we're going to be talking about today, and we're going to give you some great tips and some great ideas on how to do that. Um, for those of you that have never heard me speak before, would it be okay if I shared a little bit of my background so you know how I got here and what I'm doing? Um, I am a chiropractor. I own Parkview Chiropractic Clinic in Oakdale, and uh, I am not a first career chiropractor. I actually started out with an engineering degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I've got a master's in business administration from the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh. And every single time I get to that point, everybody who's never met me before goes, what in the world are you doing standing here teaching a class as a chiropractor? How many of you who've not met me before are wondering that right now? Just going, how did you get here, right? Okay, heads are going like this. Bottom line, um, I was blessed with a little something called sciatica. Ever heard of that before? It's irritation of the largest nerves in the body that goes down the back of the leg and into the foot. I had debilitating sciatica. I couldn't sleep at night. We just did a class on sleep not too long ago here. Um, I walked with a limp. I couldn't sit at my desk for any extended periods of time. We had young kids at the time, uh, and I couldn't even get on the floor to play with the young kids because it hurt so bad. Mowing the lawn was a pain in the backside. And I tried everything to get rid of that. I went to the family doctor, tried the painkillers and muscle relaxants and, and anti-inflammatories, that didn't help. Tried the, the PT, heating, icing, stretching, nothing worked. And basically they finally said, we can't figure out what the problem is and you're just gonna have to live with it, okay? Seven years I went that way. How many of you think there's a problem going through life like that for seven years? One day I'm at work, I'm dragging my leg around behind me and an engineering colleague said, why don't you go see a chiropractor? And I said, what's that? Because I had never been to a chiropractor. I didn't know anything about chiropractic. Long story short, convinced me to try it. And after seven years, the chiropractor actually figured out what the heck was causing my problem and basically gave me back my life. And at that point, I started asking a lot of questions. And the more I learned about chiropractic, the more interested I became in doing this as a career. So 12 years as a successful engineer, great job and all that good stuff, packed up my wife and four kids at the time and moved to Davenport, Iowa, where I went to Palmer College of Chiropractic. Anybody heard of Palmer College before? Any Iowans? We got head nodding. Are you from Iowa? or would you? not, but I've heard of it. You've heard of it, okay. Uh, bottom line, Palmer was the very first chiropractic school in the world. Um, I figured as long as I was changing careers, I might actually study so I graduated first in my class and set up a wonderful practice in Southeast Wisconsin. I was there for six years, Burlington, Wisconsin. But I'm a Twin Cities boy. I grew up here in Burnsville. And after six years down there, found out about a practice for sale in Woodbury 15 years ago. I uh, sold my office in Wisconsin, moved to Woodbury, subsequently moved out to Oakdale. And I have been blessed now to have the opportunity to touch literally thousands and thousands of lives, helping people regain their health, and then once they regain their health, maintain their health long term. I'm a national speaker. I travel all over the country teaching. I was in Atlanta a couple weeks ago uh, teaching a group of chiropractors. Amazing thing there. I, I've written two books with a third one on the way, and one of my books has won two national book awards now. So very excited to uh, have that uh, happening as well. And I am here to talk about peak performance today, and I can't wait to get into it because this is one of my favorite talks. The stuff in here works. I use it in my own life, and I think you'll find it really beneficial as well. So that's my background. I'm sticking to it. Fair enough? All right. Are you ready to learn a little something? Yes. All right. Let's get into it. My purpose here today, first of all, is we're going to show you how to increase your productivity, not just here at work, but at home, throughout the course of the day, throughout the week, doing the things that you want to do with your families. We're going to increase your energy. How many would like to have more energy? <laughs> all of us would like to have more energy. Show you how to avoid injuries. How many of you, either personally yourself, 
or know someone who's had a significant injury that's had a dramatic impact on their ability to do their daily activities, to do the things they want to do, okay? Um, this little thing back here was a problem for me for seven years, right? Injuries can be major impacts on your ability to achieve peak levels of performance. So we're gonna teach you how to avoid some things and we're gonna show you how an active lifestyle can help you lead to peak performance. Would you agree there's something you can do to improve your health? Can I see a show of hands on that one? Yeah, all right, how about Eating better, mm hmm yeah, yeah. How about exercising more? We talked about that one here not too long ago. Taking better care of your spine, making sure that your body's working properly, the nerves are connected properly. Flexibility, vitamins and minerals. How many of you take a mineral or vitamin supplement right now, out of curiosity? Okay, we're gonna get into this one today, and for a lot of folks sitting in this room, this is gonna be an eye-opener that I think will make a huge difference in terms of where you go with your productivity. So. Bottom line, a lot of things to cover here. Now, surgery is not the solution. As a chiropractor, I hear this from patients. They come in and they go, well, doc, it's been bugging me for a few years. It's getting worse. It's starting to impact my daily activities, but I'm just gonna continue to let it get worse until they do surgery and that'll fix the problem. I hear this and I, all the people in here right now are going, no, I don't know about that. For those of you who are eating right now, close your eyes. Well, all right, you don't have to close your eyes, but I'll show you this real quick. See that? That's spine surgery going on. Ooh, is right. Okay, that's nasty. I won't make you look at that too much uh, while you're eating, right? <laughs> but we know that surgery is not the answer, particularly when it comes to uh, back or spinal surgery. Here are some of those complications. Disc space infections. You get an infection in the area where the disc was. Iatrogenic instability. What that means is the spine or the back becomes unstable because of what the doctor does. Iatrogenic means the doctor causes the problem when they're doing the surgery. Injuries to the nerve roots, disc fragments are retained, disc herniations can come back even though you've had a surgery for a disc herniation, all of a sudden it comes back. The decompression doesn't work, you can have complications with uh, the fusion and also scar tissue that forms as a result. This is a little study. Have you ever heard of Spine Magazine? Anybody here? Probably not, you guys aren't chiropractors, but Spine <laughs> is the, world-renowned, the recognized authority in spine-related research. This is a peer-reviewed journal. And they published a, an article um, looking at 1,450 patients from the Ohio Workers' Compensation Division who had uh, disc degeneration, disc herniation, and radiculopathy, which is what I had, the irritation of the nerve. And half the patients in the study underwent surgery for fusion in the low back. The other half did not have surgery and tried alternative approaches. And what they found was after two years, only 26% who had undergone the surgery actually went back to work, compared to 67% who did not have the surgery. It's a 74% failure rate on the surgery. Um, and here's the biggest issue. How many of you heard we got an opiate problem in this country right now? Painkillers, right? 41% increase in the use of painkillers, particularly opiates, in the folks who had had the surgery. How many of you agree with me, surgery may not be the answer, okay? I'm gonna teach you how to avoid some of this stuff here today, and maybe you don't have to go down that road. So why do things deteriorate? Why would we get to a point where you might have to go in for surgery? Why would you be having chronic uh, pain type issues? Osteoarthritis. This particular issue is one of the most debilitating diseases we know of. It's specific to the joints under stress, and it can have a massive impact on your ability to achieve peak levels of performance. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit here today. So, as a chiropractor, one of the things that I see and we know from research, for guys, the folks that are doing the concrete work in particular have really bad backs. I find this all the time in practice. The construction workers are the ones who are having issues. For the ladies, anybody want to take a guess which line of work has the highest incidence of issues with the back? Bingo. Certified nursing assistants, CNAs who are involved in patient transfers, this is a biggie, okay? Huge problem. Again, problems showing up in the mid-back and the low-back because these are the areas under stress. However, we can have problems show up elsewhere. Study that was out here a while back said that if, if you participated in organized football, at any level, junior high school, high school, college, or pro, you're 90% likely to have osteoarthritis show up in one or both knees as a result of participating in playing football. How many of you heard that before? By the way, I played football. 
and I qualify. I got a bad knee from playing football. I got to have surgery on that thing. Um, baseball players, shoulders and hips. This is where the stress is applied. This is where we see problems showing up. Anybody here work on a computer? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, like the whole room maybe, working on a computer. We know that people using keyboards, working on computers all day long, wrists, elbows, and fingers are at risk for problems with osteoarthritis showing up. And once this gets going, it can be obviously a contributing factor not being able to do the things you want to do. I made this presentation a while back, okay? I had no idea I was going to be here today the Tuesday after Tiger Woods finally wins another tournament. Did you guys hear Tiger Woods won this weekend? Yeah. How many back surgeries has he had? Four. Four back surgeries. First one didn't work so good. Or the second, or the third. Maybe this fourth one, maybe they got it figured out. I don't know. But bottom line, golfers tend to get it um, in the low back and the hips, unfortunately. And then depending on what else you do, this particular individual is doing assembly work and he's going to have issues with the wrist, the neck, and the back because of the way that workstation is set up and the type of work that he's doing. Okay? So bottom line, there's a lot of things that can contribute to the development of osteoarthritis. So how many of you, if you don't have arthritis right now, would like to avoid it? How many of you, if you do have arthritis right now, would like to have it not have a major impact on you going forward? Wouldn't that be nice, okay? We are gonna go through some maneuvers. Now, I think I shared these with you on one of the previous presentations that I had here. I love these things. I love to teach people how to do these. For those of you who've never seen me teach before, this will be your first exposure to it. But these are awesome. Spinal biomechanical therapeutic maneuvers. Say that fast three times, please, everybody. <laughs> They're trying. <laughs> Bottom line, these were developed by a group of chiropractors who wanted to figure out what exercises actually cause the joints in the body to move. Because when your joints stop moving is when arthritis kicks into high gear. So we want to keep the joints mobile. These are designed to do that. They use video fluoroscopy to identify which positions, which movements help. So, um, these are designed to improve your flexibility, improve your balance, give you improved coordination, normalize your posture, all kinds of good things associated with these. That's why I love to teach them. Here's a couple things. We're going to do these together in a minute. Please do it with me. We may go a little faster for the demonstration in the class here today. When you do these for real, it's about 10 to 12 seconds in each position. So you don't want to do these in a hurry. Ideally, you want to do these three times a day, but once is better than nuts, okay? So if you can get one in, that's good. Do it at least once a day. Um, do it consistently. If you have any pain with what we're gonna do, don't do it, just stop. Okay? I don't want you pushing anything. I don't want you hurting anything as we go forward, okay? So we're gonna start with the neck. How many of you sit at a desk all day? Yeah, if you notice that the neck gets stiff and sore towards the end of the day doing that, this is awesome for the neck, it's gonna help maintain that. So I'm gonna have everybody sit up. I know you're eating, we'll do this. You can finish eating after we're done with the exercises. But first things first, just drop your shoulders, let them relax, and tip your head to the side as far as it'll go. And again, I'm gonna go faster, but these are about eight to 10 seconds when you're doing, or uh, 10 to 12 seconds when you're doing it for real. And then back the other way. Side to side. Good. Next. Shoulders down, tip your head to the side, and then turn your nose down toward that shoulder that you're tipped toward. Ooh, right. <laughs> I hear that. Come on back up. For some of you, your neck hasn't moved like this in years. Tip it the other way, and then turn your nose down toward the shoulder. Great stretch for the neck and the upper back area. Okay, come on back up. Then, this one I love, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your chin and stick it way out in front of you, as far as it'll go, and then drop your chin to your chest. And you'll feel that across the back of the neck and also into the upper back as well. And then come on back up. And this one, I'm gonna face you, this is fun, because I get to see all the, the folds of you know, stuff underneath here, all the turkey necks. I'm just kidding. You're going to get a turkey neck when you do this. It's okay. Everybody does. But this particular stretch, if you're spending a lot of time on the computer doing this thing, is fantastic to counteract that impact on your neck. So what you're going to do, chin up, shoulders down, 
bring the chin back like this. I call this a chicken stretch, okay? And if you want to, you can just hold that for about eight to 10 seconds and then drop your chin to your chest and hold that. This really counterbalances that tendency to have your head come forward. Come on back up and we have a question, yeah. When we come out of those postures, should we do the same, kind of the same mechanism? When you come back out? Yeah. Like bringing your head it. back up and then bringing it forward? It, you can do that, but essentially once you relax, you, it, you can go back to your normal position without having to go back through that sequence, okay? Mm -hmm. Really, really good question. All right, so next one, have you turn your face over your shoulder, as far as it'll go, and then face over your shoulder, as far as it'll go, and back to the center. And there you go. How many of your necks feel a little different now? What, what are you feeling, what's it feel like? Loose, got a little tingling going on, it's cool. All right, now we're gonna get up into the middle back area, so unfortunately you're gonna have to stand up you didn't know you were going to get a workout for lunch today, did you? All right, this is fun. You get to do a workout, get to have lunch. All right, what we're going to do, this is for the middle back now. What I have you do is concentrate your motion in the area between the shoulder blades. And all you're going to do is tip to the side, focusing the motion between the shoulder blades. Don't get it uh, down into the low back yet. Just keep it up high. And then back the other way. Same thing, tipping side to side motion between the shoulder blades. Okay, good, come on back up. Is it bad if you do lean too far? Uh, for this one, yeah, what it'll do is it de-emphasizes the motion in the middle back and you get more of the low back involved. We're gonna go to the low back in a minute, so we wanna specifically get to the middle back with this one, okay? Next one, I'm gonna stand sideways so you can see, but you're gonna hold your arm out in front of you and then just extend the arm further forward like this. And you're gonna hold that again, 10 to 12 seconds. And then same thing with the other arm out in front and extend it forward. And the motion is in the shoulder, not at the waist. The motion is in the shoulder here. Great one for the area between the shoulders. Then, next one, I'm gonna turn my back to you. They tell you never do that when you're speaking to an audience, but I'm gonna do it anyway. You're gonna hold your arms up like so, and then pinch the shoulder blades together in the back. I used to teach this class in a coffee shop on a main street going through town <laughs> at night with the lights on. Can you imagine the cops driving by and seeing a room full of people doing this? Kind of freaky, so. All right, so go ahead and bring that back down. By the way, this one here, interestingly enough, I just had a new case come in yesterday of what's called thoracic outlet syndrome. If you roll your shoulders forward like you do when you're using the computer or using the cell phone or the tablet, you do that too much, it closes down what's called the thoracic outlet. And that can cause neurological problems, circulation problems in the arms, I just had this yesterday. This particular stretch is fantastic for opening that thoracic outlet up so that you don't have those problems going forward, okay? Um, next one, shrug. Just bring your shoulders up to your ears and hold that about 10 to 12, good. And now we're gonna go into the low back. So how's the middle back feeling? Nice, got the tingling going, blood's flowing, sweet. Low back, I'm gonna turn sideways for this one. What you're gonna do is hold your arms out in front. You're gonna tighten your stomach muscles, your ab muscles, and then rock the top of your pelvis backward. I'll show you what this looks like. Tighten your stomach and then rock the pelvis back. So you're gonna tighten your, your glutes, and you're gonna tighten your abs when you do this. And if you're sitting all day in a chair, this is really gonna get that low back to stretch out, okay? Bring that back up. Next one. Now you can use the whole back, okay? So you're gonna lean all the way over as far as you can, middle back, low back involved, try and get your fingers below your knee. And if you get stuck in this position, raise your hand. <laughs> I'll come save you. <laughs> and then back the other way like so. By the way, and that feel nice? Yeah. 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 You can do these anytime you want to. That's the cool part. This next one. Now I'm going to be real, um, I want to be very clear on this. It says keep your knees straight right here and the picture shows keep your knees straight. No, no. You don't want to do that. Slight bend to the knees. Slight bend. It doesn't mean you do this thing, okay? Slight bend. Bend them slightly. Bend over and touch your toes. 
If you get stuck down there, let me know. Some of you, maybe that's the first time you've seen your feet for a while. <laughs> Come on, back up. <laughs> Next one, I'm not going to make you do this one right here because obviously, you know, sitting on the floor, but you can do this at home if you want to. Um, I, if you want to do it here, I don't care, that's fine. But this is the same kind of a deal. Make sure your knees are slightly bent when you go forward, but the idea is to stretch out the back, the hamstrings, uh, and, and the whole back. So, okay? Now, Hands and wrists. Everybody in this room probably qualifies for this. This is going to be really important. Um, for carpal tunnel syndrome in particular, these neck stretches for the wrist are fantastic to help reduce your chance of having carpal tunnel problems. Take your fingers and pull them back like this. Ooh, yeah. Does that forearm feel nice and tight when you do that? Yeah. yeah. That's because we use the, these muscles all the time so they get tight. So pull it back, let that stretch. Then pull the hand forward like this. That'll stretch the forearm in the back. It's also really, really good for the wrist joints. Then pull it back on the other hand. And this way. So if you're on a keyboard a lot, doing this multiple times during the day, really help reduce the chance that you're gonna have some issues with arthritis. Next one. There's actually joints inside the hand. A lot of people don't realize that, but we wanna get those things to move as well. Take your fingers and spread them as far apart as you possibly can. And after you get them as far apart as you can, then pinch them together and squeeze them. And that's gonna get motion into those joints inside, basically what we would call the palm of the hand. So that's good. Then the next one, again, great one for carpal tunnel. Grab a hold of your hand and you wanna pull the hand straight off the end of your forearm, like you're stretching the hand off. If the hand comes off, by the way, you are pulling too hard. You should pull so hard, back off just a notch, and then go back the other way and pull that out. <laughs> There's one that came off right there. I brought duct tape just in case, we're good. All right, then, last thing, on the fingers, awesome for arthritis of the fingers. Man, the number of patients I have who have arthritic fingers, who I've been able to do this with and who do this at home, huge difference in terms of function in the hand. So you're gonna take each digit and you're gonna just basically stretch it, pull it straight out. You may hear a clunking noise. If you do, it's okay. That's, you're not gonna do any damage with this. And just pull each one straight out. And don't do like my dad did with the pull my finger jokes. That's not funny. You don't wanna do that. And right in here, let's just stretch them out, okay? What you're doing here is you're opening those joint surfaces up in the fingers and then when you let go, they realign themselves so the joint surface is lined up the way it should be. And it's gonna let you move more freely and it's gonna reduce the chance that you're gonna have wear and tear in that joint. It's gonna start breaking down on you, so. Okay. So pull those guys out. I hear a little click. Somebody's just went pop. And there you go. All right. Give yourselves a round of applause. Nice job. Go ahead and grab a seat. How does that feel? Nice, doesn't that feel awesome? Got the blood flowing, everybody's awake, everybody's still smiling, and we still got a half hour worth of material to go through, so pretty cool. Any questions about those exercises at all? Can we find them online? Um, actually, can I get you a copy of these guys? Yeah, I'll do that, I'll, I'll get you a copy. Um, I've got a, a, a scanned version of this that you can make available for everybody then, okay? So yes, and uh, by the way, I do these every day myself, I actually tape these things inside my bathroom cabinet. So when I get up in the morning, I open the bathroom cabinet and there they are. And I go through these every single day to start the day. Um, I'll do them more often than that. Like if I've got a really busy patient schedule, I'll go through these things at the office when I get a gap in between patients just to keep things lined up and moving properly, so. Okay, um, oops, I missed one. Let's do one more here. Elbow, arms out to the side. You can do this while you're sitting and then just roll your thumbs backwards like this, and you'll feel that motion at the elbow as well. It's an area that a lot of people don't pay attention to, but there's a couple of joints there that can be a problem too. So. All right, very good. Next thing, active lifestyle. Obviously, the purpose of this class today is not a class in active lifestyle, exercise, that kind of thing, but the bottom line, we know from a chiropractic standpoint, the more active you are, the longer you're gonna have the ability to use those muscles, those joints that you're using. The more active you are, the higher your energy levels, the more likely you're gonna to be to continue to operate at peak levels of performance. So stay active. How many of you do work out on a regular basis right now? 
you guys are way ahead, seriously, of the average class that I talk to. Average, about 20% of the people in a class actually work out on a regular basis. So do something you love, stick with it, you know, go for hikes, bike rides, if you like canoeing, whatever, do something you love, but stay active, that's gonna really, really help in terms of overall productivity. So now, we're gonna change gears. Would you agree with me that you are what you eat? Would you agree with that? Would you agree with me that your energy and your ability to achieve high levels of energy also depends upon what you eat and how you eat? So we're gonna talk about that. This is a key component to peak performance here. Uh, so proteins, what are proteins? What are we using for, does anybody know? Muscle. Muscle, bingo, you got it. Proteins are the building blocks for the body, aren't they? We get proteins from things like meat, chicken, fish, nuts, eggs, dairy, Legumes are good sources of protein, and we use protein to put together the structures of our body, the cell membranes, the very components that we're made of, made up of protein. Bones are knitted together with proteins, connective tissue, enzymes, neurotransmitters, hair. I need more protein, I think, in my diet right now, but uh, hair is made up of protein. That's where the proteins go, right? Um, and we need to have protein as a part of our diet in order to be healthy. Carbohydrates. Ooh, who said, what's that? You love your carbs. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. We'll see, we'll see how you're doing on the carbs. Did you know there's two different kinds of carbohydrates? Yeah, complex is one group, right? Complex carbohydrates are fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. We'll talk more about that dietarily in a minute, but complex carbs have a lot of fiber. They're naturally occurring, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, okay? They also provide us with the fiber that we need in order to operate our digestive systems properly. Vitamins, minerals, etc. all of that good stuff comes from complex carbohydrates. Good things. <clears throat> Would you agree we eat too many carbs in our diet? Would you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, isn't that a great scene? Where he's going, I watch that and my stomach hurts. And it's like, ah, oh, man, how's he do that? We eat too many carbs as a part of our diet. And unfortunately, it's not good carbs, okay? Complex carbs are good. Fiber, minerals, all that good stuff. Take a look at this chart for a second. Um, this was from way back in 1994, but I put it up here because it's just unbelievable. This is sugar consumption per person per year, starting in Europe in the sixth century, and basically nothing up until around 1600 AD. Then look at what happens around the year 2000 in terms of sugar consumption, okay? Uh, well, this is actually the year 1900, but look at this. And I will tell you, we're right up in here somewhere, right about now, all right? Simple sugars. Big time problem with eating simple sugars, and this is part of our deal with the peak performance, because when we eat simple sugars, if you look at this red line here, this is what happens in our body. We eat a Snickers bar, for example, I'm not here to bash Snickers bars, but simple sugar. Put that in your mouth, your blood sugar goes up instantly as soon as that simple sugar comes into the body. And it takes off like a rocket right here, the pancreas goes nuts because it shows there's too much sugar in the bloodstream and it dumps all kinds of insulin into the bloodstream. You guys have heard of insulin before, right? Insulin goes to the cells and this tells them take the sugar out of the bloodstream. So they go nuts taking sugar out of the bloodstream and look at what happens here. The blood sugar drops like a rock and we go even below the level that we started at into what's called hypoglycemia. Have you ever had that two o'clock in the afternoon, sitting on a rainy day at your desk, your eyes are rolling back in your head, you can't concentrate, right? You know what I'm talking about? What do you do when you feel like that? You sleep, what do you do? Sugar, sugar bingo, Snickers bar and a Mountain Dew, and whammo, up we go again, right? On the blood sugar chart. I'm sorry? I'm not picking oh on you. Well, not you in particular, but did I did I just did I just hit it right? You got a snicker. <laughs> you realize I've been teaching this for a long time. I've never had actually somebody sitting in the room with a Snickers bar and a Mountain Dew at the same time. That's impressive. All right, let's give her a hand. Nice job. 
Thank you very much. I didn't know you were going to bring that today, but thank you. You just made my point. So, yeah, yeah pretty cool. <laughs> Here, here's the problem. We're here to talk about peak performance, right? What happens when you're here? Your performance goes right in the tank. You can't think. You got no energy. You can't focus, all right? And then we're doing the Snickers bar in the Mountain Dew to get back up again. But we're on this roller coaster, and the bottom line is the overall levels of performance and energy decrease when we do this. And more to the point, there's major health problems associated with this. Type 2 diabetes, you've heard we've got an epidemic of diabetes in this country, type 2. This is where it's coming from. Obesity, have you heard we have an epidemic of obesity in this country? This is where it's coming from, is right here. And the bottom line is, for peak performance, we got to get off the roller coaster and figure out how to keep those energy levels steady throughout the course of the day. I'll share that with you in just a minute, okay? For right now, just remember this, simple sugars, not so good, okay? Really nasty impact on you energy-wise. And then finally, fats. We need to have fats in our diet. We get fats from animal sources and plant sources, and there's saturated fat, which is solid at room temperature, and unsaturated fat, which is liquid at room temperature. And let me ask you a question. Is saturated fat good for you or bad for you? <coughs> bad. What happens when you eat saturated fat? What happens? Why is it bad? Have you heard that it contributes to heart disease, coronary artery disease, heart problems? Yeah, guess what? Saturated fat has been given a bad rap. I'm here to give you a little new advice. First of all, let's talk about where we use the fats. We use these to cover the nerves in our body. This is a neuron or a nerve cell, and we use what's called myelin. It's like an insulator on the wire of an electric wire that makes our transmission of nerve signals very efficient and effective. We need fats to build this myelin, and if the myelin is damaged, anybody heard of multiple sclerosis before? MS, multiple sclerosis, is an autoimmune disease that attacks this myelin and causes all kinds of neurological problems. So we need fat to keep the myelin healthy. But let's talk about what was done with the research into heart disease, and some of you are gonna be really happy with what I get to tell you next. Conclusions from research done over the years was that eating saturated fat contributed to coronary artery disease. What did they tell you five years ago about eating butter? Don't eat butter. What were you supposed to eat? Margarine was good for you. Butter was bad. Butter was saturated fat. Coconut oil was bad for you. Lard, bad for you. Gonna cause heart disease. Guess what? When they did the studies, they never separated out the saturated fats that are naturally occurring from something called trans fat. These are natural fats. This is trans fat. We now know, going back through the research and doing new studies, there is essentially zero connection between naturally occurring saturated fat and heart disease. There is a massive connection between trans fat and heart disease. The margarine will kill you. The butter is okay. I used to have to teach eating chocolate was bad for you. Cocoa butter, saturated fat. Guess what? It's a little bit of chocolate's okay, okay? You just don't eat five pounds at a time, that's all. Saturated fat is fine. Unsaturated fat is awesome. Olive oil, things like that, fantastic. How many of you just heard something that sounds pretty cool, right? Gotta dump the Snickers bars, but you can put a little lard in the, in the pie crust, right? It's okay? You guys are all right with that? So there you go. So, would you like to know how to translate all of this into high levels of energy throughout the course of the day? How many of you like to learn that? All right. 40%, 40, 30, 30 rule. 40% of the calories that you take in in a day should be in the form of complex carbohydrates, whole fruits, whole vegetables, limited, and I mean limited, whole grains. Research has shown that even the whole grains now are still higher in the glycemic index and can contribute to that spiking of the blood sugar. So limited whole grains, but whole fruits, whole vegetables, 40% of your calories in a day. 30% of your calories in the form of lean protein, okay? Chicken, fish, vegetable proteins, things like that, all fine. And then 30% of your calories in the form of good fats, unsaturated fat and naturally occurring 
like saturated fats. About 10% of your intake can be saturated fat in the day, all right? So 40, 30, 30. What does this do? Complex carbohydrates do not spike the blood sugar the same way that simple sugars do. So now it releases sugar slowly over time. We add in the protein. Protein takes a lot of time to convert to blood sugar. Your body's got to do a lot of work with that. So when we eat the protein, it releases sugar even more slowly. And now we have this nice steady level of blood sugar throughout the course of the day. We're not on the roller coaster. And I promise you, a little challenge. If you try this for 30 days, you come back and tell me that you don't see an increase in energy, I won't believe you, okay? This is humongous. Try it for 30 days. I eat this way in my own life. Energy level throughout the course of the day at a much higher level. How do you think that's pretty cool? Okay. Did you learn something that you can use right here? Write it down, do it. Give it a shot, see what happens. Now, I always get asked, how do I do this at a given meal? Here's a rule of thumb. Portion of carbohydrates, complex carbs, about the size of the palm of your hand. A portion of lean protein about the size of the palm of your hand. And a portion of fat about the size of the tip of your thumb, from the first knuckle to the tip of your thumb. So one to one to one tenth part is about right for the ratio for a 40, 30, 30 meal, okay? If you're concerned about calorie intake, you can increase or decrease the portion size, but don't change the proportion. Stick with that, one to one to one tenth part and see how that goes for you. You can live this way day in and day out, it's pretty awesome. Any questions on that at all? Okay, cool, all right. Next thing, water. Would you agree most people don't drink enough water? We use water for everything. We use it for metabolism, converting food into energy to get rid of junk in the body. It's how we get rid of toxins. How much water do you think we need to drink in the course of a day? Your body weight? Half your body weight. Half your body weight. Where did you hear that? <laughs> Good. I'm glad you hear that because I usually get when I ask that question, you know, four to six glasses of water a day or something like that is, is typically the answer I get. You're right on. It depends upon your body weight. You should take your body weight in pounds, divide it by two, and that's the number of ounces of water per day that you need to drink. Okay? So if you weigh 100 pounds, it's 50 ounces of water. 200 pounds, 100 ounces of water. And that's water. It's not coffee. It's not tea. It's not Coke or Diet Coke. It's not scotch. I just heard some sighs, sorry. Um, it's just plain old water. But if you decide to drink something like coffee, for example, maybe eight ounces of coffee, add in another eight ounces of water during the day. Now, some people, when I get to this point, I'm looking around the room or looking at me going, I will be in the bathroom the rest of my life. How many of you are thinking that right now? Okay. The answer is you will be. You start drinking more water, you're going to be in the bathroom more often than you are now for about three days. And then your body gets used to the water intake and becomes very efficient at it, and you're not in there any more often than you were before. And here's a weird thing, how our bodies are wired. We're designed to be healthy. If you don't drink enough water, the body thinks it's dehydrating and it retains fluids. If you start drinking the appropriate amount of water, it releases the retained fluids and you can lose three to five pounds of water weight in the course of a couple of days if you increase your water intake. How many of you think that'd be nice to lose three to five pounds of water just like that, right? And it's just from increasing your water intake. Simple, super simple. Any questions on that? Okay, cool. All right, water is really important. Next thing, vitamins and minerals. We need to have vitamins and minerals in order to be healthy. These things help us fight disease, they help us with metabolism. Um, they're essential nutrients in our diet. We get them from complex carbohydrates, fruits and vegetables. But now I'm gonna give you the rest of the story. Would you like to hear the rest of the story? <clears throat> Little study that was done. This is uh, Hort Science Magazine, another peer reviewed scientific journal from February of 2009 stating that modern farming methods, including fertilization, irrigation, and managing for greater crop yield have resulted in dilution of vitamin and mineral concentration in vegetables and some fruits by up to 40%. This is over the last 50 to 100 years in the United States and Great Britain. What does that mean? It means that even if you're eating whole foods, whole fruits, whole vegetables right now, you may not be getting enough vitamins and minerals from just the food that you're eating because the way we're raising it 
has decreased the concentration of nutrients in it. How many of you have heard that before? Where'd you hear that? So he knows. He ought to know. So he's the guy doing the, the research on this stuff, okay? I've talked to farmers as well, and they will tell, and they have told me that a lot of the genetically modified crops that we have now are geared for volume of production, but not nutritional density. So as a result, if you're eating stuff coming from the grocery store, like most Americans do, you're probably not getting enough vitamins and minerals in order to stay at peak levels of performance. Therefore, it is important that you think about a vitamin and mineral supplement, okay? Never had to teach this before, but this is what the research is telling us. Um, again, how many of you take a supplement? I, I did this earlier, but okay, just a few. You, if you're not taking one right now, I'm not here representing any particular company. I will tell you there's a lot of really good supplements out there. Talk to your doctor, talk to your chiropractor, get a recommendation, but I would definitely suggest that you do. Anybody want to find out if the supplement you're taking right now is working? Would you like to learn a little trick on how to do that? Because this is kind of kind of weird, but it's true. A lot of the supplements that are out there you pay a lot of great money for, they don't break down in the body when you take them. And as a result, they don't absorb. What's that? I heard one a day, like they've looked at people's stomachs after they've taken it, you can still see on the pill that it says one a day. One a day? day. Yeah, stomach. it's the truth. One a day, there's others out there on the market, but literally these things are clogging sewage treatment plants because the stuff is passing right through. It's not broken down at all. It's just like the vitamin went in. Um, bottom line. Take your supplement, whatever it is that you're taking, about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes later, your urine should turn a very bright fluorescent yellow color. And if you see that color change, it's unmistakable, it's very bright fluorescent yellow, those are the B vitamins that are absorbing into your body and now they're passing out through the kidneys, okay? That means it at least broke down and that you've absorbed what was in it. So do that. If you're not getting that response, either your supplement needs to be changed or your dosage needs to be changed because you're not getting enough of a dose from what you're taking, okay? So yeah, question. Is that only for vitamin B or is that represent Just vitamin B, that's, that's where the, that yellow color comes from is the B vitamin, so at least it tells you it broke down and you got some absorption going on. Yeah, it's a quick test for it, yeah. Optimal time to take a vitamin is when you remember to do it. Seriously, that's it. You just got to get it in there somewhere during the course of the day. Make it a habit. Find a time of day. I take mine first thing in the morning. When I first get up, my wife takes hers at lunch. That's just her habit. That's what works. But as long as you're getting it in there, that's, that's the important thing. So really good question. Excellent question. Okay. Um, next thing. Would it make sense to you that if you're eating great food and you're taking lots of wonderful supplements and your digestive system can't absorb the nutrients, it doesn't do you any good anyway? Would, would that make sense? Okay. So here's a little piece of where chiropractic can come into play. Um, obviously we work with the joints, keeping things moving and lined up like we were talking about before, avoiding problems with the joints and avoiding surgery. But would you agree with me, most people have a brain. She's laughing. She's going, I don't know about all this. What, no, wait a second. I'll ask it different. If they're upright and breathing, would you agree they have some brain function? Would you agree with that? What's the brain do? What's its job? Everything. Runs everything. Heart rate, breathing, body temperature, movement of muscles, digestion of food, your immune response. What did I say? Digestion of food. What connects the brain and the body together? The spinal cord and then the nerves coming off the spinal cord that branch out and they go everywhere throughout the body. Brain sends information down through the nerves to tell the body what to do. Body does it, sends information back up to the brain saying we got it done. Wonderful system, works fantastic. Except we know from research that they did at the University of Colorado that it takes pressure on a nerve as light as a feather landing on the back of your hand to reduce the flow of information through that nerve by up to 50%. How many of you have heard that before? Brand new, okay, this is new stuff coming out. Bottom line, would it make sense to you that if there's interference between the communication of the brain and the body, eventually the part of the body disconnected from the control center isn't gonna work properly anymore. Would, would that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. And this is where chiropractic comes in because your nerves that run the digestive tract and control what you absorb or don't absorb, are all part of this system. And if there's pressure on those nerves going to the digestive tract, you won't absorb the nutrients properly. 
And as a chiropractor, that's what we do is get rid of that interference so that your system will work properly. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's important. You can eat all the, get the best food and you can take all the supplements you want, but if you can't absorb it, you got a problem. Questions on that at all? Last thing, hot dog injuries. We all agreed at the start of this presentation that sometimes injuries can be debilitating to the point that you can't achieve peak levels of performance going forward. So how in the world can we avoid having injuries that may have an impact on us, right? First of all, I talked about this in my stay fit while you sit class. Uh, don't slouch. And, you know, and I'm looking around the room right now and you guys took notes when I was here. This is good, I like this, because there isn't anybody slouching that I can see. Slouching is hard on your back, it's hard on your spine, it can cause the discs in your low back to start to break down. And if you've ever had a disc problem, you know that's debilitating for peak performance purposes. There it goes. <laughs> I, when I put this up, I always hear feet hitting the floor every time. You're, you didn't even put yours down. You're just, no. you're going to keep going. You're, no. Oh, it, it wouldn't move. I see. She couldn't get her foot on the floor because the table leg's in the way. I get it. Bottom line, yeah, this is a problem. The issue that I had with the sciatica was caused by a sacroiliac joint problem. And when you sit that way, day in and day out, it puts pressure on the sacroiliac joints and can lead to problems like I had. So if you're going, if you just can't help yourself, switch one leg over the other. Don't just sit the same way all the time, but ideally both feet on the floor is ideal, yeah. So is that like after I sit at my desk for a long time, if I stand up and do one of those exercises kind of similar to what you had us do, I don't hold it as long, so I'll just kind of lean over to the side. I like feel like the bottom of my spine crack. Mm -hmm. Is that why? You got it, yeah, because your tailbone is twisting and your pelvis is going out of alignment when you sit like that. And if it sits that way too long, it'll start shifting out of position, yeah. You're fortunate if it snaps back in, that's great. If it doesn't snap back in, that's where you start having some issues. That's where problems start to show up, so. Um, next thing, I love this one. Uh-huh. I, I think I shared this little, when I was here, maybe my first talk, but I get people in my office and they go, my neck hurts. And I don't know why. And I go, well, what do you do all day long? Well, I'm talking on the phone. Well, show me. Got the phone wedge like this, and they got the computer over here like this. And this is how they spend their day all day long, and they can't figure out why their neck is messed up. Doing this routine, holding the phone on the shoulder, is really hard on the neck, can knock things out of alignment, can lead to arthritis and degenerative disc disease, things like that. So um, don't do this. Get a headset if you've got to talk on the phone a lot. If you're going to drive people nuts, you can't really do this, but if you can, use a speakerphone so that you don't have to sit with the poor posture and run the risk of having an issue here. Next thing, proper lifting technique. This applies not just to work, but I'll go through a demo here in a minute. It'll make sense. Um, anybody here ever heard of prying a rock out of a hole with like a long pole? You heard of that? Why do you use the long pole to pry the rock out of the hole? Leverage is exactly the word I'm looking for. The longer the pole, the more leverage you have, the more force you can apply to the rock to lift it, right? Longer lever, more force. When you pick something up and you have the load in close to the body, this lever is very short. When you have this long lever out here, when you hold something out away from the body, that multiplies the force that goes into the low back and dramatically increases the chance that you're gonna have an injury in that particular area. So when you're carrying a load, when you're picking a load up, you wanna keep it in close to the center line of the body so you don't have an issue with leverage. How about this one? Anybody ever lifted anything like that before? Yeah. I literally, as a chiropractor, when I see people doing this routine, I will stop them. I walk up, they don't know me from Adam, and I just tell them I'm a chiropractor, and we have a little chat. Okay. You have big muscles, you got butt muscles, you got leg muscles that are designed for heavy lifting. That's their job. When you bend over like this, there's little tiny postural muscles back here that have one purpose, and that's to move a single bone. And now you're loading those things up with a heavy load. The chances of you tearing something doing this goes through the roof. Okay. Proper lifting technique, bend the knees, keep the load in tight, do not lift with the low back for crying out loud. Next one, studies have shown that rotation of as little as three degrees in a disc can start to tear the outer fibers of the disc. How many of you think it'd be nice to not have a disc herniation? Okay, rotation is very hard on the low back. When you're carrying a load, don't lift and twist with the load. Turn your feet. 
so that you keep the load in front of you and you're not getting that torsion into the disc. If you save yourself from a disc herniation, peak levels of performance are definitely gonna be possible for you. If you ever herniate a disc, I promise you, it'll have a major negative impact on you in terms of the peak performance going forward. Do not reach above shoulders. I did a lot of industrial consulting work when I first got out of chiropractic school because I was an industrial engineer and I did injury prevention work. One of the things that I saw all the time in storerooms was this kind of routine where people were lifting loads above their heads onto the storage racks. And the first thing we did is we've got everything down lower. Reason, when you lift above shoulder height, when your elbows get above your shoulders, it pinches the area here where the rotator cuff tendons go out and attach to the side of the arm. If you're doing this all day long, if you wanna end up with a rotator cuff tendonitis or a rotator cuff tear, that's an awesome way to get one right there. So keep the loads down low, waist level or below, make sure the elbows stay below. If anybody here ever have a shoulder injury? Okay. I did, I was in gymnastics um, years ago when I was in high school, I messed up my shoulder. I literally have had to modify how I adjust my patients as a chiropractor because of that injury from way back when I was 17 years old. Think about that a minute, major impact. So be careful with your shoulders. Don't get the load too, too high, right? And here's the take home message. Injuries can occur anywhere. Look at this routine right here. Think about this a minute, what we just talked about. You go to the grocery store, you're taking the groceries and putting them in the trunk, right? You got your knees up against the back bumper, you grab the bag, you reach forward into the trunk like so, and then you rotate about three degrees to get it back in the corner. You see that might be a little dangerous for your back, for your disc based on what we just learned here. Okay. So really important, it can occur at work, can occur anywhere you go, uh, but the bottom line is um, be aware of this stuff and if you can avoid injury, obviously you're gonna be able to achieve peak levels of performance. So questions about that at all? Cool. Did you learn something today? All right, any questions at all? About anything we've covered. All right, how many of you got something that you can take with you today that you can implement in your life that's different, that's gonna improve your overall health and overall performance? Then it's my wonderful pleasure to be here with you and to be able to share this. So I'm gonna wrap it up with a gift. Look at that bunch, isn't that scary? <clears throat> I know because I've traveled all over the country teaching different groups that some of you here in this room today may be having some health issues that have been giving you a problem. Um, maybe you're not able to do the things that you want to do. Maybe you don't have the energy you want. Maybe you've got some chronic pain issues you're dealing with that are limiting you. Bottom line, um, this wonderful looking bunch is our office staff. And I would invite you, is it okay if I, if I give you a gift here today? Is that okay? If you fit that bill and you're having some issues that you'd like to have evaluated, I would invite you to come in and meet with me at my office for what's called a screening evaluation. There's no charge for this. There's no obligation for care for this. I'm doing this as a community service. It's a gift from me to you because I know some of you may have an issue. And I got into chiropractic because I had an issue that nobody could figure out how to fix. And so if there's something I can do to help you, that's my purpose here. Um, you would have a complete case history with me. We would do some screening tests to see if we can figure out what's causing your particular problem. If I think I can help, I will explain that to you. If I don't think I can help, I will tell you that as well. I don't wanna waste your time. And if you need to go find another, chiro not a chiropractor, but another health practitioner, I will be happy to make a referral for you if you need to do that. So um, if you'd like to accept that gift when we're done, come on up and meet with me here. I've got my schedule with me. We'll find a day and a time that will work. The only thing I ask, please don't schedule one of these with me unless you're serious about keeping the appointment. The reason I have a super busy office, I, I'm packed for the rest of this week. Um, it's about a half hour to 45 minutes out of my schedule that I will take with you, I'm happy to do it, but please don't schedule one of these and then not keep the appointment because there's other people who need to get in and it's just not fair to them. So I just ask you to be uh, considerate of that, okay? Is that, is that cool with you guys? Is that fair enough? All right, very good. You guys, look at that, we're just about right on time. Fantastic. You guys have been awesome. I love coming here. Thank you for the invitation to come back. I got more stuff if you want me to come back in another day, and I'll be happy to do that. And in the meantime, you guys be blessed, be healthy, and make some changes to achieve that peak performance that's worth it.